I like spaghetti. This ain't spaghetti. This is all me noodles with ketchup. War, what is it good for? Well, not for providing people with the best quality meats, coffee, and other edible items. So next time your cupboard is looking a little bare and you're feeling a little patriotic, why not throw together a meal featuring one of these 10 weird foods people ate to survive during World War II? Bubble and squeak. Bubble and squeak. Very flavorful. The potato cakes are particularly delicious. Yes, we know it sounds like the name of a band featuring Jerry the Mouse of Tom and Jerry fame and the glasses wearing bubbles from Trailer Park Boys. What's the recipe, you ask? Well, there isn't one. In fact, there's no one specific bubble and squeak meal. Instead, the BNS, as it is sometimes known, is more of a general concept recipe that involves whatever leftovers you have hanging around. Leftovers Leftovers were of huge importance, and the bubble and squeak was basically a big potato pancake filled with whatever leftover veggies and meat you had in your fridge. The one consistent thing about a BNS, though, was the potatoes. Potatoes. And that makes sense, given that potatoes were one of the most plentiful foods available during this time. Therefore, using the humble potato as the base for a meal made a lot of sense. As for the name, we aren't sure where the bubble comes from, but supposedly the squeak comes from the sound made when the mash and veggies are pushed down and flattened in the hot pan to cook them. Fake Fish Fillets You know how these days everyone is trying to make non-meat products that look like some kind of real meat meal? From veggie hamburgers to veggie bacon, trying to simulate meat for non-meat eaters is big business. In the UK, a classic meal is the famous fish and chips. However, during World War II, getting their hands on fish wasn't so easy. So creative chefs came up with another way to recreate the fish fillets of the iconic dish, and it involved rice and eggs. That's right, they made mock fish fillets without using any fish at all. Want to make them at home? Well, all you got to do is mix up the rice and eggs into what is basically a fried rice patty. Fishy, fishy. Now cool the patty in the fridge, then take it out and cut it into fillet-sized pieces. From there, they would take the fake fillets and fry them up. Now, if they could manage to get their hands on some bread, even better. They would then bread the fillets and fry them again until they were a yummy golden brown. Fried rice is delicious, and pretty much anything breaded and fried gets a thumbs up, so this one sounds like a win. And for anyone who doesn't like fish, now you have a tasty mock fish fillet to enjoy while everyone else is doing the real seafood thing. Wartime Sponge Cake I like to see a man of advancing years throwing caution to the wind. It's inspiring in a way. Yes, it's true that sponge cake existed way before World War II. It actually dates back to the 14 and 1500s and Italian chefs during the Renaissance, whose baking skills were put on full display with what they called biscuits, forerunner to what we know as the sponge cake. However, classic sponge cake requires a few key ingredients, namely sugar, flour, eggs, and butter. During the war, many of these ingredients were in high demand by the boys on the front lines, particularly the sugar and the eggs. Smells chocolatey, eh? And this, in turn, meant they weren't always easy to find on the shelves of your local grocery stores. But people still needed their sponge cakes, of course. And that is when the Welsh version of the dessert became quite popular. It used alternative ingredients for the eggs and even sugar, such as a whole lot of syrup, milk, and margarine. It has been said that this version of the classic cake isn't as fluffy, or shall we say spongy, as the OG version, but it did come close. And what while close isn't always good enough, during World War II, an almost classic sponge cake was just right. Replacing ingredients, finding solutions, making sponge cake, no wonder they are called the greatest generation. Bean cake. Don't be greedy. Let's pass it along and make sure everyone gets a piece. While we like beans, and of course we love cake, putting the two together doesn't sound very appetizing. Unless it's carrots, we don't think veggies or beans should come near our cakes. But let's all take a breath and relax, because bean cake wasn't a cake of beans, but rather a cake made using beans as a replacement for flour. Flour was not always easy to get one's hands on during the war, so creative bakers had to come up with alternative ingredients to do what flour 
flour does. And interestingly enough, beans were one such alternative. Cake! Everybody loves cakes! Now, anyone who's ever been on a school playground knows that beans are the magical fruit, but it turns out that making us toot isn't their only power. If you boil them down, then mince them up, guess what? You've got yourself a malleable substance that can be worked into a cake or other such items to hold it together. Now, beans do have more flavor than flour, and it isn't necessarily a flavor you want in a cake, but when they are boiled and minced and combined with a few tablespoons of sugar, it can can be quite sweet and tasty. Or at least that's what we've heard. Roosevelt Coffee. President of the United States of America. I have no idea what that means. People can do without a lot of things, but take away certain items and you could have a revolution on your hands. Things such as cell phones and coffee are two such items. Well, back during World War II, people didn't have cell phones and weren't posting how-to videos of their favorite wartime recipes on TikTok, but they were drinking coffee and a whole lot of it. That is, until America got into the war. After that, the country started shipping their coffee beans overseas to caffeinate the troops, which meant that folks back on the home front had to go without. In fact, during the war, there was so little coffee in the country that Americans had to make do with less than one cup of joe per day. So what could they do about it? Well, short of moving to Colombia and taking over a coffee bean field for themselves, they had to come up with a coffee alternative. Which brings us to Roosevelt Coffee, named after President Franklin D. Roosevelt. You rock. I am a big fan. <laughs> Roosevelt coffee wasn't coffee in the traditional sense, but instead was derived by mixing various ingredients together, such as postum and chicory. Postum is composed of wheat, molasses, and wheat bran, and acted as the coffee, while chicory brought some spice to that morning cup of coffee-ish liquid. Economy loaf. You hungry? Hey, Ma! Can we get some meatloaf? Meatloaf dates back to the 5th century, but the meatloaf as we most commonly know it these days didn't show up in cookbooks until sometime late in the 19th century. And by the early 20th century, it was a staple in many kitchens around the country. However, once the Americans joined the war, most of the available meat was sent to the troops, which meant cooks back home had to find something to replace the meat with. And in a move that would make vegetarians proud, vegetables were used to make what became known as the economical loaf. The most common recipe for this meatless meatloaf combined peas, mashed potatoes, and condensed tomato soup as a substitute for the ground beef. The meatloaf! We want it now! Throw in your spices, form it into a rectangular loaf, and bake it up. Sounds like a great way to use up leftovers and make sure everyone is getting healthy doses of vegetables. There's no record of whether or not they doused it with ketchup, as many do with actual meatloaf, but it might have been less necessary given the tomato soup flavor baked right into it. We're going to remember this one the next time we have a dinner party and have to make a separate dish for our vegetarian friends. Onions stuffed with grape nuts. Like onions. They stink? Yes. No. While some things like meats and flour were hard to find and heavily rationed on the home front during the war, there were food items that were actually quite plentiful. Among them were certain vegetables, like onions, that were easy to grow but could not be exported across the ocean without spoiling. This is why people were encouraged to eat them and use them often in their meals. And sure, if the Outback Steakhouse chain had existed back in the 1940s, they would have taken over the country with their bloomin' onions. But alas, the chain did not come into existence until 1988, and Americans during World War II were not privy to the awesomeness that is a bloomin' onion. Instead of blooming the onions, chefs during the war came up with the idea of stuffing them. They would stuff them with a number of ingredients, but it seems as though the most popular was grape nut cereal. Hey, who left this bowl of onions here? Now, if you're thinking that this doesn't sound very appetizing, well, supposedly folks back then weren't too impressed by the dish either, feeling that it was generally quite tasteless. However, you can find updated recipes online that include some flavorful spices, leading to a much more satisfying final dish than what was usually the case in kitchens around America during the war. Braised beef tongue. I don't know if you're a calorie dog, but you're definitely a downer. 
While meat was scarce back home during the war, there were certain parts of the cow that were more readily available than others. And while a nice flank steak or a T-bone were hard to find, families on the home front could usually get their hands on the tongues and the feet. Although neither sounds too appetizing, cow tongue can actually be very tasty. It's not my fault there's nothing good to eat on this planet except meat. And back during World War II, home cooks were finding this out as they created casserole-like dishes using veggies and the aforementioned bovine tongue. At first glance, the tongue does appear to be rubbery and a little tough to eat, but after a good two hours of boiling and then a nice bake, cow tongue will taste quite good on your tongue. In fact, while it might sound a little off-putting to the North American palate, people around the rest of the world have been eating cow tongue for a long time. From Korean and Japanese barbecue restaurants to Mexican tacos de lengua. As for those cow feet, cow foot stew has been thought of as an aphrodisiac as well as recommended as a cure for a hangover. Sawdust bread. No, why would I get fat? Bread makes you fat. Bread makes you fat? You know what carpenters eat when they get hungry after a hard day milling, sanding, and routing wood? They eat a sandwich or grab a burger or something else. They don't eat sawdust. But back during World War II, sawdust wasn't just a byproduct of woodworking, it was also a fortifier for bread. You see, while people in North America had access to wheat, the Europeans weren't as lucky. And so, when it came to making bread, they had to come up with something else to hold it all together. And for some reason, they decided that sawdust, also called tree flour, was that something else. Or just eat it all the time without even stopping. <laughs> These days, it seems like everyone is making their own bread, so if you're curious and are tired of making sourdough every week, there is a German black bread recipe that you could try. You will need half rye grain, two parts sliced beets, two parts sawdust, and one part minced leaves and straw. Just mix it all together and bake it as you would bake non-sawdust bread. While it doesn't really sound all that appetizing, we have no doubt there will be a slew of TikTok sawdust bread cooking tutorials any day now. Spit soup. This guy makes the best soup in the city, Jerry. The best. Sounds delicious, doesn't it? Actually, despite having the most unappetizing of names, spit soup was actually a rather yummy creation of the Polish people during the war. Life in occupied Poland wasn't great for many reasons, and a daily problem was the lack of access to many of the food items that made their food so rich and hearty. Foods like sardines and oysters were no longer on shelves, as were items that you might not have thought of, like chestnuts, for example. Example. But one item they did supposedly have in abundance was barley. While we probably would have just made copious amounts of beer, the Poles were smarter about it and used the barley to make what became known as spit soup. No soup for you! The soup contained the barley, potatoes, as well as any veggies they had. Sounds pretty good, right? But you're probably still wondering how it got its name, right? Well, the barley wasn't husked, which meant people had to spit out the husk while they ate, hence the name Spit Soup. Why they didn't just call it barley soup instead of referencing the unappetizing act, we don't know. But if you decide to make it yourself, we suggest purchasing husked barley and avoid the family spitting around the dinner table. But that's just us. You do you. Check out more great videos. Just tap or click, hit that subscribe button, and ring that notification bell.